Hey, it's E.B. Moss, and this is episode 42 of Insider Insights, and I am here today with Jonathan Gadai, who is the CEO of Adomni, and Matthew Gussin, who's the VP of Managed Services of Amobi. And the topic today, okay, get this, programmatic, out of home, and mobile technology. So if you know anything about me, you know that I'm mostly going to sit back and listen to the two smart guys in the room <laughs> chat with each other. So how are you, Jonathan? I'm doing great. It's good. Great. It's been a great few days here in New York. Oh, good. I think we lucked out a little bit with the weather. We did. I'm from Las Vegas, so it still is pretty hot where I come from, so it was a nice little temperature drop off. Well, yes, going from <laughs> 160 to 60 probably does feel pretty yeah, good. Slight yeah, slight difference. Yeah. Yep. And Matthew, how you doing? Thank you for having me, and it's great. And you're an L.A. guy, yeah? Based in the West Coast as well. Okay, everybody else always has the good weather. But whether or not I speak up much, we're going to get some really good insights from these two guys, again, about programmatic out of home and omni-channel inventory and sales. Absolutely. Let's get some insights. I'm E.B. Moss for Media Village which drives the business of media, marketing, and advertising forward through content by, for, and about thought leaders in ad tech and ad agencies, the audio space and addressability, even those who are advancing diversity. So let's get some insights. So we're back with Jonathan Gadai, the CEO of Adomni, and Matthew Gussin, the VP of Managed Services of Amobi, in the hot seats today for Insider Insights. And I always like to start it out with explaining a little bit about who the heck they are. So I'm going to start with Jonathan. Jonathan has an interesting story. He is, as we said, Las Vegas-based He is the CEO. He's been on the board of the DPAA, which I think is Digital Place-Based Advertising Association. Mm -hmm. So that's everything out of home. And he's got such a a multi-tiered background. He has been a graphic designer, a software development, a marketing specialist, and operations. Jonathan, that's crazy. (laughs) All the different hats you wear as as an e-commerce guy and as a startup guy and yeah, makes, it's makes really you a, CEO a technologist worthy. at heart. Yeah, yes. good. Yes, absolutely. All right, now, now you know how everybody does their job and can, you know, course correct as needed. Yeah, I can relate for sure. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so Adomni has a really interesting background, an interesting origin story. And since podcasting is all about storytelling, can you share it with us? Absolutely. So I am one of three founders of Adomni. The idea actually came about in 2009. Jonathan Fine and Bob Stockham, my two partners, own a couple of billboards in Las Vegas. And at any given time, they had 20 to 30 percent of the billboard space that was unsold. They're, they're digital billboards. So really, Adomni came about from their side as a how do we increase our revenue on these boards and drive a 70 percent occupancy rate closer to 100 percent? And their big idea was, well, why don't we do it online? Why don't we make it easier for people to buy these screens than the way that it's been done really since billboards came out? You know, like billboards, one of the oldest mediums, you know, and it's always been a relationship-based buy. It's always been a multi-step buy. And in the age of Google, Facebook, and Amazon, their idea was, well, let's put it online. And they tried for three times to build at Omni. And at the time, you know, this is early days, 2009, 2010, for programmatic and online advertising, it's, it was still early go- days. really going through yeah. its What's you know, programmatic? display advertising. Yeah. And mobile was just coming online. So I actually met Jonathan, one of my partners, where he was dating my wife's sister. That was actually how we first got connected. I like this story already. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the process of selling my business. It was an e-commerce company where I spent my entire career out of college doing online selling of, of, of imitations, printed cards. And I was looking for, for the next thing. And he said, check out this Adomni thing. And this was now 2015, after they had tried three times and unsuccessfully you know, built this platform. And I said, Jonathan, this has to exist. Come on. It's 2015. And when I looked into it, we did the research. It turns out that at that time and even today – 
most of the ads that are sold in the out-of-home world is done person to person manually. So I got really excited about the opportunity to help bring my e-commerce and online kind of buying prowess to a medium that we all can agree is kind of here to stay. You know, we're all traveling throughout the world and there's always going to be ads. So Ad, Ad Omni really got started in 2015. And along the way, so at, in Las Vegas, Zappos.com is headquarters. I don't know if you guys knew that. And they were just, had just recently been acquired by Amazon in, in 2015. It was like a year or two before. And I was on the board at the local university with Chris Weiss, who was their director of software architecture and one of the main guys who built the, the, the tech infrastructure with, with Tony Shea. And so I brought Chris in. We built a, a core team of engineers. And that was, that was 2015. And we had our, the first billboard running the Adomni software in early part of 2016. Oh, and, and I do want to say that you wrote something in one of you, the articles that you've penned on Media Village. Little plug there. <laughs> You're a great writer as well as a graphic designer and software guy. No, no. <laughs> um, and you wrote that out of home isn't just in your car or when you're walking around. It really is your entire life outside the home. So that's a lot of inventory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and people don't, I think, realize you know, so much attention has been put on online ads, mm -hmm. and certainly television is 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 what it is as as a medium. But out of home advertising is actually the second largest reach medium behind television in terms of impressions. So it reaches ninety percent of consumers, and it also comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. You know, people think about just roadside billboards, yeah. but there's also screens in bars and restaurants and in shopping malls. And well, let's talk about those bars and restaurants. I think you left out part of the storyline about. That's right. So so Jonathan Fine is, in addition to being now my brother-in-law and he was how we <laughs> connected to Adomni, uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. And even though he owns parts of, of billboards, as an entrepreneur trying to promote his own brands, he was frustrated by the process to even get that inventory and his messaging up on his own boards. So you think about the best companies, a lot of them are built out of necessity by the founders who are having a real problem. And that's our, our story as well. So Jonathan wanted to make it easier for small business or, or large brands to buy online. And he also wanted to have a nice return on his investment for the billboard itself. So those two things came together and the idea hatched. And then we built a really great team around it. And it's been evolving. I mean, 2015 to, to where we are now, we went from just that one digital billboard in Las Vegas to over 130,000 connected screens. And we're talking about the... 30 different media types, not just the big stuff, but there's you know, point of sale screens and tops of ride share vehicles driving around New York City and Los Angeles. I would say that's the biggest change that we've seen. You would have to go source the inventory from each person in every single market and out of home in its previous existence mm -hmm. before Jonathan and his team really helped pioneer this. Well, there's a lot of companies who raise their hands saying that they have capabilities, but when you peel that onion back just one layer, you actually realize there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. So to be able to get access, instead of having to have 50 campaigns to launch a campaign across the entire country, if you wanted the entire U.S. reach, you can now access one platform. So that idea of having that reach uh, with the right messaging, with the right creative to reach your right audience is now possible. And Matthew, you should know, because I didn't give you full shrift in terms of who you are, just like we talked about Jonathan's background, but you worked with Quantcast for four years and Audience Science and Business.com, and you play in a lot of pools. And we were speaking before we went on mic about how omnichannel content, advertising, et cetera, is so essential today because you have to follow the consumer wherever they are, indoor, outdoor, across, as you said, every screen. So I'm going to give you the opportunity now to explain what a Mobi is as beautifully as you told me when we were off mic. Yeah, absolutely. A Mobi is an omni-channel advertising partner. We can start with campaign metrics and insights by targeting and tagging all of your campaigns. You could take advantage of deep learnings by either utilizing your first party or second party or third party data as well as CRM. 
from once we have an understanding of who your top performing customers are, we can help you understand where they have the highest proficiency to actually spend time based on what your key performance indicator is. And so based on that, we're going to put together a campaign that's bespoke to each customer that we ever work with. Wow. And are there privacy concerns? There's absolutely privacy concerns. There's different things you have to be aware of, whether it's COPA compliancy when you're trying to target kids, whether you're targeting people 21 plus, pharma with NAI issues, cannabis with the the different challenges in every single state. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of different things you have to be aware of. And when we're working with partners as a consultant, the best way that you can be is help educate them, inform them how they can navigate around all these challenges in the marketplace. So which one of you wants to explain the symbiotic relationship between a Domni and a Moby? I think either, either of us can probably speak to it. I would say if we step back and look at what originated this coming together of the two companies and even just coming together of the two worlds, there's a convergence that's happening. And marketers are caring less about what is the screen size and type and flavor and medium and more about results and how they can drive those results and how they can do it in, a, in as easy and as transparent a, process, a way as possible ha, has really been our focus. So building our platform where we focus first on digital at a home and then over the years realizing that there's this amazing combinatory power of mobile, the mobile devices and serving ads there to people that were exposed to the at a home screens. That was actually what, what got uh, Adomni and Amobi together to be talking about, well, how can we work together to connect these two and then bring more value to our customers? We realized it was a fragmented journey. We lacked a digital out-of-home partnership at Amobi. They lacked a mobile extension and some of these other things, and it really just brought us together. So when you take advantage of their best of breed technology and the best of breed technology that we have, that to his point, it's extremely complimentary. And then you're able to then reach an audience that is in market, that is that digital out-of-home audience, but also capture them when they're on their mobile device or listening to Audible or listening to even potentially this podcast. Yes. So very yin-yang. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very complimentary. That's great. So I hear the the evolution of things and, and as we said, the symbiosis. Let's talk about the evolution of the out-of-home medium overall. You've also described how turnkey you're trying to make the buying process, and you've related it to another new phenomenon, new-ish phenomenon, uh, almost as easy as finding an Airbnb. So Jonathan, describe where out of home is today, where it's going in the next several years, and then how filling in the the ease of use in buying kind of makes it a bright future. Absolutely. So there are a number of different trends happening. For us, where it started was on the supply side. For out of home, this very rich, impactful medium to be harnessed uh, in a platform, you needed to have critical mass. Buyers need to be able to come in, find what they're looking for, whether it's audiences or geos, and be able to have their budgets be spent and be measured in a way that fits to what they're doing with the rest of their their objectives. So for the last three years, we've seen a major evolution in the, the major media owners embracing programmatic. So companies like Lamar and Clear Channel in the billboard space and Lightbox in the shopping mall space. They have reformatted their their selling models and reformatted their technology stacks to make this possible. It's still something that, you know, the vast majority is still being sold by salespeople. But that's the opportunity that we see where right now 95% of the inventory is sold relationship manually versus in the online world, 85% is sold programmatically in the U.S., so we, we see that there's going to be a shift from a, from the way that it's being bought and sold, but it really started first with the, with the suppliers. Companies like ours, where, where we've partnered with either the suppliers directly or supply-side partners, are now coming to market with buying platforms that make it literally as easy as booking a hotel room or you know, booking a restaurant reservation. And so that's been sort of our innovation in the marketplace is – creating a transparent buying process where you look at what Google, Facebook, and Amazon have done and how they've just literally swallowed 70% of of ad dollars, a lot of that is because of how easy it is, right? Because of its convenient. And certainly the measurability is a big piece. And that's, I I think, where out-of-home has always been second 
to the other channels because you didn't really have a sense for who the audiences were that you were reaching and what's impact or return on ad spend you were getting from the dollars you were putting in out of home. And that's also been changing. Jonathan, that's sort of your core competency as well, right, in terms of the the data points and the models that are driving these ad campaigns? I think, you know, being able to complement with what Jonathan's doing, we're able to triangulate and really understand what are those characteristics that make up who their ideal customer is. And But that's before we even learn anything there is about who that customer is. And so what we try to understand, once a company gives us uh, some of their learnings together, we're going to understand where their hidden audience is. If you think your sweet spot's California and New York, if I show you Des Moines, Iowa's over-indexing, Is that a value? Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to help the customers do. Not just take advantage of what they already know where their exact audience is, but help them fish where they didn't even know the fish are. I love it. Now, Jonathan, were there a lot of young women in Des Moines who responded to the Kylie Jenner campaign? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or were they more in Las Vegas and L.A.? Sure, sure. And will you explain what I'm talking about? (laughs) Yeah, so so Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, 1,099 other cities. Okay. So, yeah, so going back to your question of how things have evolved and how now the inventory is really that available at scale. In May, we had the opportunity to work with Kylie Jenner and her team. They're a client of ours that really had not done much in the at-home space, really focusing on the social channels because that's where their audiences yes. are, and, and it's worked pretty well for them, I would say. Yeah. But you may have noticed, I don't know if you follow them, but you may have noticed that on a personal level, they use billboards to put up their messages, and they have an affinity toward it at a personal level. They just see that as a great extension. So it was a Friday that we were able to have a meeting directly with Kylie's team, and they explained that that next Wednesday, their skincare line was launching. And literally within two business days, we were able to identify the markets they wanted to reach, identify the media types they wanted to reach. And we launched the largest programmatic billboard campaign ever, which was 4,300 roadside billboards at the same time. On top of that, we had over 300 shopping malls that had, you know, video ads, you know, portrait for that consumer. So you had the outdoor, the indoor, and we call it like it was the the national Kylie takeover, something that really had never been done, not even by the biggest of brands to be able to do that simultaneous of a reach. And what was interesting about it was they didn't know when they were going to sell out, right? This was a direct to consumer product. And they also sort of needed help on the creative. When you talk about out of home, there's a lot of different sizes and shapes. And so There were some variables there, and with our technology, they provided two ads, a vertical and horizontal, and using our bulk content creation tool, we made 44 other formats, and we made it in three different messages. One was, it's going live at 9 Mm a.m., and then the the other one is live now, available now, and then then a, a sold out, and it was literally executed right on schedule. And they sold out you know, <laughs> that same day. It triggered the, the messaging to change. And it was, it was a home run of a campaign for them. But it also showcased that out of home right now, this is possible, mm-hmm. right? And, and it also isn't the kind of thing that you have to spend millions of dollars to achieve. It's surprisingly affordable given what you're actually reaching. So we've got some more stuff cooking with them. And, and ultimately, it was a fun one. And then we look at you know, the, the sold out part, Matt can talk a little bit about, okay, so you're sold out, then what? Right. You know, if you're doing an out-of-home campaign. And this is where it becomes that handoff of the baton, right? And yes. what I mean by that is the next step should be, let's capture an email address. And by capturing the email address, we're now able to inform your customer of that next step. Hey, we got more product back. Don't miss out again. And now you have the opportunity to retarget Take that audience that may have missed out, capture it, and then have the ability to retarget it with the message later. And that's what we realized, even if it's something that's very DR-focused, how you can actually take it, take those learnings, and add it to your brand messaging to expand it even further. No wonder you guys like each other. That is a a beautiful (laughs) story. Yeah, (laughs) no, it it truly is complimentary. And some say that, you know, arguably mobile is out of home. You know, you're spending 70% of your waking hours out of home, so you're in an out-of-home mindset. And some say that at a home is arguably mobile, you know, where people are on the go. And and, and and this is where I say you need to have an omni-channel approach. Yes. 
And Jonathan, did you have to put your graphic designer hat on to do those 44 iterations within two days or, or did you leave that to no, the so, others? So, so the, nice, <laughs> the nice thing about that is we, we built a technology that actually automates the mechanical reformatting. Oh, so, okay, So good. with those two layered files, within one hour, we're able to output 44 and it's without any of the Photoshop. That's where I feel when you heard what Jonathan said early on. We needed to be more similar to Google, Amazon, and Facebook because mm -hmm. there's a lot of tools that are simple to use. Mm -hmm. Well, if you give two basic formats and you don't have to do anything in a matter of a couple hours a day, you get 44 versions back. That's extremely powerful. Phenomenal. On the almost polar opposite side of things, we have a big election coming up. And I know that historically, there's been a bit of credit around how some elections were influenced or will be by programmatic. Do you want to speak about that? And who wants to start? I'll let Matt lead yeah. that one. I'll kick that off. So obviously, we're getting ready for a very big election. Yeah. Let's rewind to the last election for a moment. And I think this will be a great way to kind of kick this session off. When you think about how the dollars were spent, you had one party that thought everybody was their customer. And what that means is you're going to go target all 50 states and every single demographic 18 plus. The other party, at the very end, we'll discuss who's, what, you know, who's who. <laughs> the other party said, we don't need to be in every state. We already know that no matter how many dollars, even though we have super PACs, it doesn't make a difference. It's the lecture college is really what matters. There's certain swing states that really matter. And by putting together a big data campaign versus a spray and pray model, you're able to target the specific coal workers when you needed to in Pennsylvania to get those specific votes. And so based on that, that should have given it away. Yeah. Fast forward post-election, it was a pretty big landslide compared to what everybody thought in the Republican Party won. Mm -hmm. Well, what was interesting enough, a lot of the people that worked on the Republican camp worked on Barack's team. Oh, so applied knowledge. So the interesting thing, the Democrats had the ability to take advantage of the same strategy as Republican. The difference was they thought everybody was their target audience. Big data versus small data strategy. And so now that we're embarking in this next coming election, and it's to me, it's very much the wild, wild west right now, being able to tap into what we're doing with big data now and applying a digital out of home screen too, mm -hmm. I think it's just very complementary. Obviously, the way that you triangulate certain areas to go after the constituents is going to be different, but the learnings that we have in key states, key screens, we could take advantage of it. Very well said. Yeah. So there's 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 a targeting side to it and then and then ultimately it's just having an open mind to use new approaches or new innovations and do some testing and then take the, that that testing and apply those learnings toward something bigger you know certainly like matt mentioned barack obama found that success with social media and, and the activism that he was able to to bring that's something that's that's kind of ever changing right and from campaign to campaign, there's there's different platforms that pop up. There's different mediums. But at the end of the day, the core is still there, and that's reaching the audience. Who can reach the right audiences at the right time with the right messages? And the difference is that this landscape has never been more fragmented. I mean, consumers have so many options with where their attention is going to go. And so when we look at the traditional ways, which has been TV or online, and to some extent out of home, but not even close, we say, wait a minute, we have an opportunity now with programmatic where you can both target your audiences using the data sets that Amobi and Adomni have with Place IQ and all the various you know, proprietary data sets. You have the ability to reach on an inventory basis 90% of consumers as they're not staring at their TV or on their computer at home, but in a, in, you know, just, just traveling through the world. And you have the ability to change out content. So that's the biggest thing about these elections is there's constant different talk tracks and different latest trends that it's sometimes hard to change a TV campaign or right. um, to do that. So online has been great for that. But now all of a sudden, the real world can be what's the latest tweet that needs to be responded to and who can do that more effectively. And we think it's going to be really exciting to see how both you know, the parties and the different groups that are, have issues that need to come to the forefront that people are voting on how they can look at out of home and say, oh, wait a minute, this could be the difference maker. And let, let's let's give this a shot. And you can do it in the primaries and a test and then 
or you can wait and do it, the big one. But I, I think it unlocks a completely new opportunity to, to reach voters that they never had before. That's interesting. So you want your political out-of-home advertising to pivot. You don't want your desired politician to pivot. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking a little bit about creative, um, I in my last episode, I had Jennifer Zimmerman of McGarry Bowen, and she was talking about the essential need to marry data and creative and whichever one comes first, you know, there might be a different outcome. What's the most creative aspect that we can see implemented in digital out of home? Is there anything that comes to mind or how do you help buyers think about the creative possibilities? Yeah, I think it varies by what vertical that you're speaking to. We've had several meetings that we've met with different people, Warner Brothers, by adding a cl- like a clock mm-hmm. counting down to when the movie gets released. Uh-huh. There's unique things like that. You could have travel with the travel, then you add in a weather element to the creative, which helps really engage the audience. Similar to what you heard with uh, the Kylie campaign, by running in the right billboards in the mall, that drove the audience to go buy that product as they saw it there. So there's different ways that you can capture the right audience by using dynamic creative that's also changing based on where the customer is at in their journey, whether it's going from digital out of home, realizing they saw it on their mobile, and then transitioning them to continue further down that funnel, you're able to really engage with them so they feel like it's a one-to-one connection versus just being broadly spoke to. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's also it can also be storytelling, sort of like the old Burma shave days. It's the evolution of, of outdoor and telling the story at, in the right time and the right place. Yep. It's that on steroids, mm-hmm. where where when you have these dynamic ads, which are HTML driven, the ability to bring in the latest news, the latest sports scores, the latest, you know, it's raining, and so let's put a piece of creative up there that says order pizza in. Like, there's all these amazing things that first had to be possible, right? I mean, it's great to imagine this, and it makes sense, but the actual technology needed to exist. Now that's been checked off the box so now it's limited by just the the brands and the agencies saying, okay, let's harness this. Let's tell a story that we're not placing the same ad on the large format screen as we're putting on the mobile ad, but they need to be connected in a way. Mm-hmm. And you see, I think the biggest and most successful brands and agencies have realized this. And I've heard of campaigns that had upwards of a million different permutations of creative that are specific to just what's going on in the environment and who you're trying to reach. The moment that we're in right now feels eerily similar to what I experienced in 2009 when I went to programmatic for display day one. People are like, what's programmatic? (laughs) We work with these specific publishers. Why would we buy from you? And there was only 25 million impressions available on a daily basis. Fast forward today, there's 50 billion impressions available. So what has happened in the market? They've adopted it. Publishers have pushed more inventory there. And I really think that they're on the cutting edge of taking advantage of what's really going to blow up. I just want to wrap things up on more of the the company side. So that's the the industry and the environment and the opportunity side. But I bring this up because Amobi was named Fortune's top 10 best workplaces in advertising and marketing. And, and Jonathan, I know that you have a, a diverse staff as well. And that's something that We talk a lot about at Media Village. So how do you create a compelling environment in today's digital media company? You know, I think taking a step back, people work for great leaders. And what I've learned is you have to empower your team and you have to give them the opportunity to grow and shine. A lot of this generation want instant gratification and expect it. And so you have to figure out how to adjust and align. So maybe every nine months versus every two years, a person gets some sort of promotion Mm -hmm. or you have that. So once you can figure out how you keep your team happy, satisfied, and motivated, I think that's really, really critical. By then adding in the right type of both internal and external events, different learnings for them to get by bringing in third-party stakeholders to to take advantage of of that learning and that growth, you create that ability for people to want to stay, that foundation for them to see that you're investing in them, not just helping them 
accomplish what they want. And then lastly, the way that I round it out from my team, I always try to figure out what they want to accomplish personally, whether that means somebody wants to get married, somebody wants to buy a house, unlocking what their actual real goal is and why they work Mm -hmm. so that we can accomplish those results together. So nice. Yeah. And I would echo that and say, I I believe in all of that and some in in that I've, I've, from my career, really been an ops and process guy as much as I am a person and relationship guy. And recently read a few books that have helped shape my way of managing and, and the way of setting up the, the, the workplace. Do you want to um, name names? Drop book names? <laughs> sure. So, well, there's a concept called OKRs. Oh, yes. Uh, Objectives and Key Results that came out of Intel and, and it's, it's been went to Google and spread and a lot of different companies are using it. And I think ultimately it comes down to a, a healthy work environment is one where there's alignment. Mm-hmm. And to achieve alignment, you need to have transparency around your expectations, your goals, the communication flow. Um, And so we adopted OKRs last year. And I think it's been a really great just individual tactic where our team members can actually help define what they want to do in the upcoming quarter. And it's not me dictating, but it's we set an overall roadmap of where we want to go. And it's individual saying, well, here's how I'm going to contribute to that. And it goes from like the the lowest end employee all the way up to me, and it just flows and connects. And so that was something that that we found really helpful in, in, in helping us a stay prioritized on what matters, right? By writing down what you wanted to achieve, you know, you can stay focused. And B, you get buy in from the people because they feel like they're part of it instead of being told what to do. I think ultimately the vision of the company and where it's headed needs to be something that excites your your staff, right? We do a, a screening process when we're hiring you know, new employees that that ensures that it's not just a nine to five mentality, but it's like, this is the kind of company we're building and where we want to go. This is the kind of impact we can have on people's lives. And you believe in that as a person and you want to help contribute to that. And that's something that, you know, is over the years, something you have to figure out how you can determine one person versus the other. But ultimately, you know, we're really proud that we're a company full of entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurial spirit, you feel it um, when you're when you're working with that kind of a, a group. And as we scale the business, which we're going about to do a major hiring and scaling effort, we can only hope to preserve the things that have helped us get where we, we are now and and do more of it. Beautifully said. And y- you know, it almost seems that you embody programmatic manual, if I said that right, where you know you have things processized, but you're you're very human in the approach. And, you know, I know that you can't see it in the room, but I feel the great relationship here. And I think that both of you are really leveraging relationships in the real world, as well as in your companies. And it, it's coming across in terms of how you do business. So you. Matthew you. Gussin and Jonathan Gadai, Moby and Adomni, <laughs> respectively, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. I'm E.B. Moss, and you've been listening to Insider Insights from Media Village. Check us out at mediavillage.com, and I hope that you'll subscribe to Insider Insights wherever you listen to podcasts. 